configuring a NetR5 or NetR9 receiver for a single base station setup. To start, talk to your IT department and or your internet service provider. You will need to get from them a static IP address for the receiver, the subnet mask, the gateway, and the DNS address. If the receiver is going to be behind a firewall, IT will need to configure port forwarding for port 80 for the web UI of the receiver and a port for correction data. 5018 is the default for an open connection or 2101 is the default for in-trip. Connect the NetR9 receiver to your LAN or router with an Ethernet cable and turn it on. DHCP is enabled by default on the receiver, so the network will assign it an IP address. We'll change this to a static IP address later. To check the IP address that's been assigned, press the up arrow on the faceplate of the receiver and record the IP address. Once you've recorded the IP address that the local area network assigned to your receiver, open up a web browser and type that IP address in. and hit the enter button. This will go ahead and open up the web UI for the receiver and by default security is turned off so it shouldn't ask you for a username or password. We're going to set that up later on. This is a NetR5 receiver I'm using for this example but for what we're going to do today the settings will be the same for a NetR5 or a NetR9 receiver. So the first thing we need to do is go ahead and change it from DHCP to a static IP address that your IT department gave to you so that the receiver always has the same address and we know where to find it every time. So we're going to go to Network Configuration and we're going to go to Ethernet and we're going to change it from DHCP to a static IP and right here we'll type in the static IP that the IT department gave to us. Then once we've typed that in, you can make any changes that you need to here, you know, get your IT guys involved if they need to change anything. We can do that, but the main thing is we want to make sure we set a static IP address in here so that the IP address isn't changing on us. So once we've done that, we'll click on Change Configuration, and it's going to let us know that we need to reboot the receiver for this to take effect. So we'll go ahead and hit Receiver Reset and we'll give it this one minute before we try to reconnect. Once we've allowed the receiver to reset, we'll need to type in the new IP address. In order to connect back up to the web UI. Once we type that in, the web UI will reopen. The next thing we're going to do is enable security on the receiver. So we'll click on security on the left. By default, security is disabled. So we'll click on configuration. There are two different ways you can enable security. If you just choose enabled, anytime anyone tries to log into the web UI, they're going to have to put in the username and password, whether they're the admin or whether they're just a user. or you can use enabled with anonymous access. If you just have people that need to uh, download data for post processing or something like that and you don't want them to have to use a username and password, you can set it up for enabled with anonymous access and give that person access to file downloads or file, or file deleting, but all the settings on the receiver will be grayed out so they can't change anything. We're going to go ahead and set it up for regular security so that you have to use a username and password so I'll enable that and I'll click OK. So it's going to ask for authentication. The default username and password is admin and password. These are both lowercase so we'll type those in. Click OK and now the security has been configured so that we do have security enabled. If you want to change the password, we can go back to security, go to change password. Now for the admin account and having control of the receiver, the username will remain as uh, admin, so we'll type that in, but we can give it a new password. And just repeat that.
So now we have the security set up on the receiver. It's going to ask us, since we changed the password, to log in one more time. And we're all set. Now we'll cover how to create users uh, for field use if we're using the uh, in-trip caster and, and trying to log in from the field. We'll cover that a little bit later. So the next step will be setting up the receiver to log data in order to position the receiver. So we'll go to data logging and under the default tab we can click right on default and what we'll need to do is check the box for enable. Now, there's a couple of different ways that you can log data. We're going to use the online positioning user service to position our base station. It requires at least two hours of data to get a decent position. And the, the more data you gather, the better average position you're going to get for your base station. You can use the drop down menu and set it to always. And with it set to enable and always, we'll make sure we're logging a TO2 file. When it's set to always, it's going to log until we uncheck the box for enable at a later time. So it's just going to keep logging data, keep logging data. What I recommend is logging data in a continuous manner, coming in here and setting it to continuous. Set it for 1,440 minutes, and that's 24 hours. That way we can log a 24-hour file. It'll stop, start another file, log another 24-hour file, stop, log another 24 hour four hour file and it'll keep doing that continuously until we turn it off. If you get three to five days worth, three to five 24 hour files, that's going to position your base station very well. So that's the way I'd recommend doing it. Now when it starts off, it's going to start at whatever time you started at, say noon Eastern time, but then at midnight UTC, that's when it's actually going to start the 24 hour uh, countdown. So you might get a five hour file, an eight hour file, then it'll start a 24 hour at midnight UTC time, and then at 11 59 59 59, it'll stop that file, and at 0 UTC time, it's going to start up again. So do at least three of those three to five days if you want a really good position on your base station. So continuous 1440 minutes, we'll do TO2. We're going to set it to 15 seconds. That's fine. Again, Opus is going to decimate your data to 30 seconds anyway. So 15 seconds is fine. Five minute on the positional. We're going to log it internally um, to the receiver. And for this, I don't really need to change my name style. I'll go with the serial number, the Julian day, and then the file number there. And once we have that set up, we'll click on OK and you'll see the file is pending and then it'll start logging data and it'll tell you the path that it's going to there. Once you're done logging data you've got your three to five 24 hour sessions you can log back into your base station using your IP address in the web browser go to data logging and we'll click on default and go ahead and uncheck the box for enable that way it'll stop logging data click OK we see here now that it's been disabled and to download those files we'll go to data files click on that there's the files that have been created I got a couple of short ones that's the one that, that I started the first day and it didn't uh, it didn't get a full 24 hours because it reset at midnight UTC and this small one here is the leftovers from the day that I disabled it. So I've got three other files that I want to download. To download those, I just click on the icon to the left of the file, and it'll automatically start downloading it. Now that I've downloaded my TO2 files, I'm going to open up my File Explorer and just copy them from my downloads to a different folder on my computer just to keep them safe there. So I'm going to go to my documents, create a new folder, and call it base T02. And just paste those files in there. Now that I've got them stored on my computer, I need to convert them to Rhinex to the Rhinex format to upload them to Opus. If you don't have Trimble's free 
convert to Rhinex utility. You can download it from Trimble's website. So I'll open up a new tab in my browser and go to Trimble.com. And once the Trimble website opens up, I'll go to support and training, then go to support A to Z. And under support A to Z, I'm going to click on the R and find Rhinex in the list. When I click on Rhinex, first you need to download and install the Trimble configuration utility. This has all the antenna models for all the different GPS antennas in it that the Convert and Rhinex program needs to convert your TO2 files into Rhinex. Then after you've downloaded and installed that, you'll need to download and install the Convert to Rhinex program. I already have it on my computer, so I'm going to click on my Start button, All Programs, go to my Trimble folder, and inside the Trimble folder, there'll be a Convert to Rhinex folder, and click on Convert to Rhinex. When Convert to Rhinex opens up, I'll go to File and Open and browse to my document folder that I created for my base station files. There's my base TO2 folder. Open it up and I can select all of them holding down the shift key and hit open and you can batch process these and uh, not have to do them one at a time. So it's scanning the files as it brings them in. Once it says complete, then it scans through it. And once all three of them say complete, we'll go back up to file at the top. We don't have to change any settings. Just go to file and choose convert files. Now it'll start converting those TO2 files over to Rhinex files. And when it's finished, you'll get a success to the right of each file name at the bottom. Once all three of those are done, then we can close the Convert to Rhinex program. Now I can browse for the uh, online positioning user service in my web browser. I've got it in my favorites. If you don't have it there, easy thing to do is in Google or any search engine, just go to NGS, the National Geodetic Survey, Opus. And if you search there, it should take you right to it. Then I can click on that link. And once the Opus page opens up, I'm going to go to Choose File. Now, the, uh, the Rhinex converter doesn't give you a choice on where your files are going to get stored. That's why I moved my TO2 files out of my download folder and put them in a separate folder on my computer because Convert to Rhinex is going to create the Rhinex files in whatever folder the TO2 folders were in. So I'll go to Documents, go to my base TO2, and you'll see here, sort them by type. There's my TO2 files. I've also got O files, 15O, that's just the year, N files, and G files. The only ones you need are the O files. And you can only submit one at a time to Opus. But I don't need the N and the G files. Those are my navigation files, ephemeris files. Opus uses its own. So I'll start with the first one, which is 65 here. Just going in the order of the days. Open that. Choose my antenna. With a Net R9 or a Net R5, chances are you're using a Zephyr Geodetic 2. So we're going to scroll all the way down to the T's. And the 55971.00 is a Zephyr GNSS Geodetic 2. So we're going to choose that. We're going to keep our, uh, our antenna height at zero. That's going to give us what's called the antenna ARP, or the very bottom of the antenna where it's screwed onto the threads. That's where we want our elevation to be. Then I'm going to put my email address in. And we're sending this to Opus Static. Opus Static will handle between 2 and 48 hours of data. These are 24-hour files. So we're going to use Opus Static. Just click on Upload to Opus Static. It's going to warn me here that, that my antenna height is 0. And it just wants to warn me, make sure I didn't leave it out. I'll click on OK. And then it's going to take a second because these are large files. But once it's uploaded, it'll give us a message letting us know that it's been uploaded. 
once your file's done loading, you'll get a message that's saying the upload's been successful. Then you can return to the Opus page, enter, enter in any other file. So in this case, we had three files. So we just load the three files. It'll remember your uh, antenna model and your height and your email address, and you'll just need to upload the other two files. Now, once you've uploaded those, I've got an example here of one that I got back from Opus. You should have numbers up here. If your base station's out in the open like it should be, you should have numbers up here that are, you know, 85, 90% or above on the observations used and the fixed ambiguities. If those are lower than 85 or 90%, you might have some objects close to your base station that are blocking the sky or causing multipath, and you may need to consider moving your base station. The other thing to look for is down under the reference frame, these are what are called peak-to-peak -peak errors, and you can see those are very small. Two millimeters for the latitude, five millimeters for the longitude, 15 millimeters for the, uh, for the ellipsoid height, and 31 millimeters for the orthometric height or the ground elevation. Generally, you want to see your latitude and longitude below two centimeters for a good position. In the uh, elevation or in the heights for the ellipsoid height and the orthometric, metric elevations somewhere below five centimeters is good for that three centimeters preferably so here we've got a pretty good position a few millimeters on the latin lawn and a uh, less than five centimeters close to three centimeters on the heights so these are the values that we're going to use we're going to use under the nat 83 2011 not the igs 08 but nat 83 2011 we're going to plug this latitude and the west longitude into our base station and we're also going to plug the ellipsoid height in there. So what you would want to do is get all three to five however many uh, opus sessions you did, take those, average those positions, they should be very close again, you should average those positions and then we'll use those average coordinates to put into our base station. So I'm going to move that out of the way, go back to my base station where we left off at data logging. To enter the position into the base station, we're going to go to Receiver Configuration. We're going to choose Reference Station. We're going to put in a, a name for our base station. I'm going to call this DPI underscore base. And now I'm going to key in my uh, average reference latitude, longitude, and height from those Opus reports that I averaged together. So my latitude here is 35. 55, 26.64725. My reference longitude, now we're going to use the west longitude that was averaged together from the Opus report is 86, 52, 4. 46, Two five one, and then I'm going to put in my average reference height, which in this case was 174.833, and you want to use the EL height from the Opus report, the ellipsoid height, height, not the ortho height. So once I've got my base station name in, I've got my coordinates in. I'm going to make sure I've set that to west longitude. That's very important. So I've got north and west. I've got my latitude, my longitude, and my height. I can click on OK, and the base station has now been positioned. Now, it's going to give me a, uh, a warning that it's far away from the current base. Because for this section of the video, I didn't have an antenna hooked up to the receiver. That's fine, so we're going to click on OK there. And now our base has been positioned. Once the base station has been positioned, click on Antenna to verify that the proper antenna is being used. In this case, we are using a Zephyr Geodetic Model 2, and that's standard for a Net R5 or Net R9. If you need to change it, you can do so in the drop down list. We'll leave it at a Zephyr Geodetic Model 2. The Rhinex name, the part number for the Zephyr Geodetic Model 2 is fine. Don't need serial numbers. We do want to make sure it's set to bottom of antenna mount, and we want to leave the antenna height at zero. That way, it'll match up just like we submitted the data to Opus. Once we've got that set, click on OK. Next, we'll set the receiver up for data logging for raw data to be used for post-processing in the office in a program like Pathfinder Office. 
So we'll click on data logging and then we'll create a new session. We'll give this session a name of Rhinex because what I'm going to do is set it up to store Rhinex data on an FTP site. So then someone that's logging data out in the field with a, uh, a geo or another mapping device can use this data from the FTP site in Pathfinder Office to post processor data. So I'll give it a session name of Rhinex. We want to click enable to start logging data. We're going to set the schedule to continuous and here we're going to do a duration of 60 minutes. That way it's only creating files that are an hour in length so that if somebody didn't didn't download or didn't do field work for a full day they don't have to download a day's worth of data. They can download just the amount of time that they need. Format will be TO2. I'm going to switch the measurement interval over to one second for this. Leave the position interval at one minute. File system will be internal. Pass style we can leave at session and date. We'll want to change the name over to year, year, month, month, day, day, and hour, hour. That's what will work well in Pathfinder Office. And then we'll go ahead and check the box for one in our FTP push and tell it to convert the files to, you could do either Rhinex 3.00 with observables and ephemeris or Rhinex uh, 2.11 with observables and ephemeris. I'm going to go ahead and do Rhinex version 3 and then click on OK. It's going to go ahead and get that set up. While it's getting set up, we're going to go over to FTP push and go ahead and set up our FTP site. So enter the address of your FTP site. Then put in the username and password. Go ahead and verify that. We'll change our pass style over to this format. Set rename to no. And then we can click the test button to make sure that everything's entered in correctly. This will go out to our FTP site. It will create a folder called Rhinex because that's the, uh, the session that we created and then store it inside that folder with this path style. Once it pops up and says OK, we can press OK. We know it went out and did the test and it was able to log in OK. Next, we're going to go to I.O. Configuration and set up our in-trip caster to broadcast real-time corrections out to the field. So we'll click in trip caster one check the box for enable we'll leave the port at 2101 i'm going to give it an identifier of dpi base and then i'm going to give it a mount point the mount point name of dpi underscore base underscore cmrx that's the type of CMR or compact measurement record format that we're going to broadcast out over this port. So next we'll come under CMR, change it over to CMRX. We don't need to change anything else. We can leave everything else the way it is. Click on OK down at the bottom. It's warning me because for this portion of the video I don't have an antenna hooked up to the receiver right now. So now you see in our I.O. configuration that in trip caster 1 at 2101 is set to output CMRX. The next thing we need to do is go back to security and create logins for users in the field to be able to log into our base station and get that CMRX correction over port number 2101. So we'll come to configuration and we'll add a user. I'll create a username for myself, put a username in and a password, 
And for this user, I'm just going to give access to the in-trip caster. That way they can get those broadcasts out in the field. So in your software on your uh, data collector, your geo, whatever you're using, this is when you go to, uh, to set up your login. This is the username and password that you put in. So I'll click on add user there. And then I could just go back through secure security and configuration and I can keep adding as many users as I need to. The last step for setup would be to have IT to forward port 2101 to a public IP address so field users can access the corrections from the in-trip caster. For TerraSync or Access setup instructions, see our Success Center videos on configuring TerraSync for VRS data collection or creating a GNSS contact in Trimble Access.